Hi, everybody, and welcome. And welcome, Ashley Anderson Zantop. Ashley, it's so good to see you. Where Where are you beaming in from today? I am beaming in from the Twin Cities, from Minneapolis. About Amazing. you, Adam. I'm in Brooklyn, good old Brooklyn. All right. Um, well, I, I'm really excited to have a conversation about your work, your leadership, and what's going on at Cambium. So we've known each other now for a couple of years. I had the pleasure of serving briefly on the board of Cambium and got to know you in the COO role. And so excited to see that you're now the CEO after, it's been about a year now, right? Um. Actually, we're heading into year three. Uh, but not of the, of the CEO, uh, altogether at Cambium and then a year at CEO. Is that right? That's right. Okay, great. So I want to talk a little bit about your background because I think you bring something really special to Cambium. And we're going to talk more about Cambium itself uh, and what you're doing there. But but first, you you studied education. You've studied many things, but education and business. And uh, you were a classroom teacher as well. Tell me a little bit about the journey from sort of classroom education, studying education, being in the classroom, and then moving into business, and now bringing those threads together. Yes, happy to. Well, you know, I'd like to say that there was a grand plan right from the start, but there wasn't. This is more about following heart and following purpose more than anything else. Um, yes, I trained as an educator and I worked in the U.S. and Scandinavia um, in classrooms. And I also worked as a collegiate coach and, you know, I loved it. I really loved it and was absolutely mission driven um, to make an impact on the one hand. On the other hand, I, you know, was so impatient in sort of that true idealistic way about wanting to make an impact at a larger scale. And, you know, one of the things that really cemented the move or the change from in classroom work to the business of education for me was my really my first opportunity to build curriculum from scratch and my, you know, my very first, my own opportunity to create a curriculum that aligned to state standards in, in Michigan, and that I felt would be more engaging and more effective for students. So I did that. And that just created a spark um, or flipped a switch for me, which made me feel like I just wanted to do that at scale right away. And um, rightly or wrongly, I felt like the way to do that was to move into the business of education. So I could do that at, at scale, at a greater and greater scale and have an impact on more and more students and ultimately more and more educators. So that's what really prompted my jump from in-classroom work to the business of education. And that's what I've been doing over, you know, ever since, you know, at sort of greater and greater scale. Amazing. So now you're leading Cambium and Cambium is an extraordinarily big brand that reaches many students through a variety of sort of perhaps better known other products. Can we talk a little bit about Cambium and the brands that are housed within Cambium and, and how people can think about what Cambium then represents as a, as a holding company or a broader entity? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some people will say, well, you know, are you a branded house or are you a house of brands? Um, you know, folks will ask that. And the answer is really both. Um, we really for Cambium were defined by our purpose and our purpose sort of writ large is to help every teacher and every student feel seen, valued, and supported. And then when we think about that larger purpose, we're actively looking for the opportunities to create the greatest impact in K-12 inside of that purpose. And that's what each of our power brands really represent at Cambium or the brands that we think of as associated with the individual business units, each of those teams and those brands are pursuing a purpose and a value proposition that supports students, teachers, and our customers that fit inside of that larger purpose. And so the larger purpose is really about defining um, in ways that are personal, um, that we can pursue for our users and for our customers, but also that we can strive to live authentically internally. That purpose is really the personal articulation 
of our strategy and what we're trying to achieve in, in case. And, and let's just, let's just name the biggest and best known brands in the Cambium house. Can we? Sure. Absolutely. So when we think about Cambium, we're thinking about brands like Lexia, Learning A to Z, Explore Learning, Cambium Assessment, and Time for Learning that are the five sort of power brands that live inside of the Cambium universe and that Cambium purpose. Great. So let's pause on Cambium for a second and talk about the moment that we're living in, which is it's always challenging to work in education and, and educating a, a kids has never been easy, but boy, is it a hard moment. And I was going through uh, one of your reports and some of the stats about the moment that you all are reporting are 37% of 12th grade students today are reading at or above proficiency, only 37%. Less than 25% of fourth and eighth graders in poverty are performing at grade level. 45 per students or 45 percent of students or less are prepared for college level math and reading. And on it goes. Let's start with that. We'll talk about what's happening with teachers too in a moment. But how do you think about addressing the pro a problem that is so intense right now, particularly coming out of COVID with so much learning loss and so much complexity in the system? Yeah, and I would layer on to that. I would just add and build on that, Adam, by saying, additionally, we see the challenge almost as an inverse of the 80-20 rule. If you look at um, you know, some of the data that was published by ACT last year, we saw that barely 22% of graduating seniors in 2022 graduated ready to take courses, college level courses in reading math, science, and literacy. I mean, that's just the fundamentally the wrong side of the 80-20 rule. When we think about what we're actually achieving and what we've achieved um, for the students that we're supporting in education and across the education ecosystem, for us, I think we're, we are a combination of hopeful um, and also just fueled by the need to make an impact on this challenge. Um, you know, the things that we see that give us hope and that we think about as we think about the ways to help improve student outcomes and support teachers in that process, you know, we think about some of the things that we, the surprising things we learned in the pandemic, you know, in the midst of the, this kind of horrible tragedy that everybody's coping with, we suddenly saw things like you know, families kind of sitting side by side in some cases at kitchen counters and parents and caregivers suddenly having a real first person insight into what students were learning and how they were learning it when they were in remote school um, or learning remotely that created maybe a more immediate sense of connection to what students were learning and how they were learning it than existed for many families um, before the pandemic. You know, we also saw, hey, we were actually able to mobilize significant investments um, in education and the education ecosystem, which included things like making and continuing to make significant investments in the availability of devices and in implementing wider broadband access, um, internet access for families and communities and we also saw a real will to implement and leverage the power of technology to help really accelerate and drive instruction and to sort of unleash that to personalize instruction in new ways that we just hadn't seen before, Personal. which is re really powerful and, and important for our organization and the purpose that we're trying to achieve. And we are really mindful that we're at the moment where we have to double down on that and we have to accelerate that. We have to continue to accelerate that while we see and because of what we see with all of the challenging outcomes that you just described and so many more. Yeah, I mean, and so, I mean, I think some of the things we're hearing about again and again in the K-12 system is kids are coming in with a very high level of social emotional dysregulation, a high level of academic need right? In some ways, more technology comfortable than ever before, and yet also probably in need of time away from technology. You have solutions that can help across the board here. How, what kind of guidance are you giving to teachers in the classroom around how to leverage personalization, real personalization, not sort of buzzwordy, 
and how to use technology in ways that really support the overall goals of the classroom. Yeah, I first of all, I think um, it's hard for us to talk about any of this realistically without also talking about the things that we think are fundamental to supporting teachers so that they can do that, so that they can address those things. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, we get asked regularly is, well, where what are areas that you're going to continue to invest in now um, on the other side of the pandemic um, that are going to be critical to improving academic outcomes and to supporting the kinds of situations that you just talked about, students and teachers and administrators coming in feeling like they're in emotional distress sometimes. And, you know, one of the things that I bring it back to is some of the fundamentals of just personal leadership, regardless of whether you're talking about a stressful business environment or a stressful education environment. When we think about our ability to be successful doing anything, of course, we have to know what our purpose is, what we're trying to do, and we have to be aware of and hold ourselves accountable to the principles by which we want to pursue our purpose. But in reality- I didn't know which principle you were holding yourself accountable to. Our principles, yeah, yeah. PLE or PAL, but okay, probably both. <laughs> well, maybe both in this case. Um, <laughs> but, but um, well, and we can come back to that. But I think the 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 net net is we have to have the capacity to do any of that, right? To pursue any whatever our purpose is in accordance with our principles. And I, yeah, of course, we can think about capacity in terms of like our skills and abilities our network and the communities that support us, but we cannot ignore physical and mental wellness as part of co cultivating capacity. Whether we're a CEO of an ed tech company, whether we're an investor, whether we're a classroom teacher, whether we're an administrator or a student or a parent who's trying to think about how they're gonna get through their day and all of the challenges in front of them, we really can't ignore that fundamental component of capacity. And that's true for our students. And that's as true for the teachers and administrators we support who are trying to support our students and our families and our community. And I think because of that, um, and a number of real, other really critical challenges in the ecosystem, we're seeing a greater demand than ever before for professional learning of mm. all kinds, not just sort of the traditional, I'm going to go through a traditional pre professional learning and certification process, but also increased demand for bite-sized professional learning delivered just in time alongside of lessons that have to be delivered just in time. We're seeing increased demand for subscription access um, to modular um, professional learning. And that's a massive area of development and growth and innovation and investment for us because we have to think about the fact that hundreds of thousands of teachers have left the profession, K-12 teachers have left the profession in the course of the last two and a half years. I mean, the equivalent of entire states worth of teachers, multiple entire states worth of teachers leaving the profession over the course of the last few years. And we just don't have enough teachers in the classroom to support the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. The teachers who are in the classroom, we have to help them feel confident and ready and able to do the work. Um, it, who it, wants to show up to a job where you don't feel like you're going to be successful um, yeah. every day? No one. Yeah, the stats are, are unbelievable in terms of teacher. Well, they're very believable, but very sad in terms of teacher turn turnover. I think it's better than I've seen a couple of studies that say better than 50% of teachers are saying they would not recommend the profession and they are personally considering leaving. Um, it's interesting because I think maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a company bringing an educational solution into a classroom probably wasn't thinking about the classroom as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But I hear you talking about it in kind of ecosystem terms. How do we support the teacher? How do we support the student? How how does that how does that actually manifest in product and technology? How do you think about building technology for personalization or for professional development that supports this moment that we're in? Yeah, uh, such a an important um, question and distinction 
Adam, in terms of how we're thinking about it. Uh, you know, we all know the paradigm of um, of an exciting piece of technology that causes um, many of us to be excited about developing a tool or a product um, based on that exciting piece of technology and defining around that. But I think for us, it's critical that we define and organize around our purpose, the students and teachers we're trying to support and our customers who have to make the decisions about how to support um, students and teachers. And we have to remind ourselves always to think about technology as a tool for supporting people. And in that environment, you know, a classroom is an ecosystem. A school is an ecosystem. A district is an ecosystem. And the stakeholders in the ecosystem are varied. Of course, we think about students and teachers. We also need to think about administrators. We need to think about families. We need to think about um, decision makers, whether they're legislators or other types of decision makers in the ecosystem, and be mindful um, that it takes everybody in the ecosystem to either make something work or make something not work. Um, and so when we think about investing in the outcome that we're trying to achieve in the ecosystem, we have to think about all of those pieces. So even though we like to talk about companies like ours, like EdTech organization, um, that's a way of describing it. We are much more than that. We have to be in order to be successful. So yes, we are going to develop tools that are going to support teachers and support students, whether that's professional learning or whether that's curriculum or whether that's assessment. All of those tools are really important, but as important as the tools. And sometimes more important because it's a gating factor is how do we implement those tools? How do we help teachers, administrators, and students know and understand how to be successful with those tools? How do we help them get the most out of the tools that they can with reporting and information to inform their decision-making and next steps? And that's, that's really critical. So we have to think about the ecosystem that we're designing for and then we have to design and implement around that ecosystem. Otherwise, we're just putting a Band-Aid on something or we're saying, hey, here's this great solution to this piece of the puzzle, but we're leaving the rest of the puzzle unsolved. <laughs> you know, I think that brings us back to sort of where we started in some ways, which is I think it's incredibly powerful to have you as a former teacher and someone with a degree in education leading this organization, because I think. I've always felt like you're naturally empath empathic and empathetic towards your employees and your teachers, but you can hear that in the conversation about the way you think about Cambium sitting in a classroom. Can, can we talk about another sort of aspect of that briefly, which is, okay, you're a teacher, you're a, you lead as a sort of a teacher does, you bring people along, I've watched you do it. Um, what is it to lead an organization today? Because organizations are also under real stress. And yeah. so, so what is it, what, what is, what are you thinking about with the Cambium employee experience and how to lead people in really a complex moment? Yeah, it's such a good question. I mean, organizations like ours are also multi-stakeholder organizations. Um, and so we have to think about that ecosystem as well. And I think, um, you know, it, it's, so interesting because it is not enough um, as much as so many of us in the organization are compelled and driven and really committed to it. It is not enough just to have a purpose about who we serve, right? We are clear that we serve students and teachers and that our purpose is to help every teacher and every student feel seen, valued, and supported. But that is not enough. We also have to live that purpose authentically, internally. Um, and that means we have to strive to help every one of our employees feel seen, valued, and supported. And that means we have to constantly be questioning, are we doing that? Um, you know, where are we not doing that? Where are we not doing that well enough? Um, how do we improve on it? The same way that we have to be questioning that about the people we serve, um, students and teachers, and that is the nature of innovation. We have to be 
innovating for the people we serve, but we also have to be constantly innovating for our own ecosystem so that we're striving to live that purpose internally. And that means, honestly, Adam, everything from the practical nuts and bolts all the way to the products and solutions and services that we deliver. And I mean, really everything. We are constantly evaluating things like our benefits. Do our basic benefits achieve that that goal? Helping our employees feel seen, valued, and supported. Do we have leave policies that are equitable and inclusive and help people stay engaged in the workforce? Um, do we have benefits that and support all employees equitably? Are there any barriers to access um, to any of our benefits? I mean, we're talking about real nuts and bolts stuff. When you think about the ecosystem that you're supporting, it is, it's incredibly important to have a purpose that you feel aligned to and compelled by. And that is absolutely what gets me out of bed every morning. Um, you, but you got to live that purpose internally um, or you're going to fall short. And or you at least have to be striving for it and striving to hold yourself accountable to it. And that really matters today for, you know, for everyone so that we can feel like in good faith, we're doing the work that we're committing to do. So we're going to be having, I mean, all kinds of people will hopefully be listening to our conversation, um, but certainly amongst them will be up and coming leaders in education organizations and also probably lots of educators. For for either of those audiences, do you have any advice on being a leader in the times we're living in? Yeah, um, I think the first is, yeah, you know, it's always challenging to be an effective leader and to hold yourself accountable to being an effective leader. Uh, it's particularly challenging when you've got really dynamic conditions, changing conditions. So whether that's the kinds of conditions that lots of folks have had to live through, like pandemic conditions that are changing rapidly, or just other changing dynamics, um, the ability to keep uh, teachers in the classroom and help them feel supported in the classroom and turnover or keep employees engaged in an organization and turnover related to those things or changes related to those things. Everybody, you know, have different sets of dynamic conditions that they have to operate in. And I will say this, I do think that um, there are a couple of really important basics that any leader needs to bring to the table and any individual can help hold themselves accountable to as a personal leader, which is um, first, you should develop a, at least a shorthand about a personal leadership framework. What is the purpose that you want to pursue? Does it align with the organization that you work in or that you operate in or not? Because if it doesn't, you're never you're never going to be happy and you're never going to be a fit. So what is that personal purpose um, that you have? And what are the principles that you want to hold yourself, LES, accountable to as you pursue that purpose? What will make you feel proud about how you did what you did when you look back on it? Um, what do you want to hold yourself accountable to? Those things matter. Um, those things matter because you will have to make tough decisions quickly. And so if you don't know those things and hold them at the front of your mind, you're not going to make decisions that align with what you want to hold yourself accountable to. And so I would say, know those, you know, for me, those are tenacity, empathy, and allyship for a lot of reasons, but particularly for the types of times that we operate in in a highly complex, multi-stakeholder environment, those are the things that I think we need to be successful. Um, lastly, you got to actively cultivate your capacity. Um, not only your skill and your knowledge and your know-how, um, but also your community, the community who supports you and that you support um, in order to be successful in your mental and physical wellness. If you don't cultivate all three of those things, you can't expand your capacity and you won't be able to lead your organization or your teams to be successful. That and then I think, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, and the last thing I would say about that is you, you can't, you cannot and should not expect to be the smartest person in the room. It's not your job to have every answer. It is your job to bring the right stakeholders to the table. It is your job to bring the right people to the table and set the table, but don't expect to or try to 
have all of the answers. You can't and you won't. You'll have your own blind spots and biases, things that you can't see. Bring the right people to the table and you will find, set the table and you will find the answers that you need. Uh, it's so important. Amazing. Tenacity, empathy, allyship. I love it. Ashley, it's so good talking. I can't wait to see you in San Diego and uh, to continue this conversation as we all work to make our improvements in this very important and, and sometimes challenging and exciting space. Have Adam, a thank you so much. It was so fun to talk to you. I can't wait to see you in San Diego. All right. Awesome. Take care. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Adam. Bye.